we're going to begin a new series, and it's on Twisted Scripture, untangling 45 lies that Christians have been told. I'm not sure where the series is going yet. I'm going to go week to week. Maybe I'll hit every one. Maybe I'll skip some. But I'm just going to see what I see. And this morning we're starting in the very first chapter with this lie. Now let me say at the outset that this is going to be a tremendous reaffirmation for some of us. A tremendous reaffirmation of what we already believe. For some of us, if you've been at this church for a decade, it'll be a reaffirmation of some previous thoughts I've shared about baptism. But what I like about this series is that we're just going to hit power-packed passages in the Bible week after week after week, and we're going to affirm what we believe here at Church Without Religion, what we're about, and what a Jesus-centered theology really looks like, and why that matters for daily living. And so, let me just say with that, well, let's open with a word of prayer, and we will jump right in. Father, we thank you. For this time, we just ask that you would minister to us in a powerful way today and throughout this series that we would see Jesus Christ high and lifted up, seated at your right hand, us seated there too. So much to reveal to us, Father, so much to teach and counsel us. We ask you to do so in Jesus' name and we thank you. Amen. Lie number one, you must be baptized in water to be saved. Now, if you haven't heard this, all you have to do is travel a few miles and you're going to find one church or another that is going to say, man, it is great that you have faith in Jesus Christ, but man, it is awesome that you have accepted the gospel message, but sound familiar? 2,000 years ago, there were people coming in behind the apostle Paul and saying, Paul's message is great, but you need to be circumcised. Paul's message about a spiritual truth is awesome, but you need to do something physical to make sure that you're truly right with God. And of course, Paul got hot mad about that, totally frustrated with the Galatians for being suckers of that sales pitch. And so he says to them in their face, you foolish Galatians, who has tricked you? What did I teach you people? And who has come in twisting the scriptures on you, twisting the message so that it's Jesus plus circumcision? Now, you fast forward 2,000 years later and would not the Apostle Paul come to some of us today and say, you foolish Americans and you foolish Canadians and you foolish, you fill in the blank because the worldwide church, the bride of Christ all around the planet has entertained on some level corporately or individually, this idea that if I'm not down in that water, then I'm not okay with God. And Paul would be irate about that today, just like he was furious with those adding circumcision. So we're going to journey through some scriptures this morning and see the truth about this idea of baptism in water. 1 Corinthians chapter 1 says this, Has Christ been divided? Paul was not crucified for you, was he? Or were you baptized in the name of Paul? Remember, these are those Christians who are fighting and bickering and even bragging. Some of them are bragging, well, I got baptized by you know who. I got baptized by Paul himself. And then others were, well, you know, I mean, I got Cephas and he's pretty cool. (laughs) But if you were baptized by Paul, man, they were thinking that is a big deal. Not only did I believe in the gospel, but I got the seal of approval from the Apostle Paul. He held my head, man. He grabbed a hold of the back of my hair and dunked me in, and that was Paul himself. So, whoa, I'm not just a Christian. I am a super Christian. (laughs) Paul style. Now, Paul hated that. I mean, we find out in the book of Corinthians that they're having divisions and factions. And it's almost like as early as 2,000 years ago, they're almost going to create denominations right on the spot if Paul doesn't stop them. I mean, there's going to be the Cephas group and the Paul group. And here's Paul trying to bring them back to the centrality of Christ and say, Look, did I hang on a cross for you? Uh, No, 
That's not the message I brought. Were you baptized in my name? No. Even if I held you under, those are not the words that came out of my mouth. You were baptized in the name of Jesus, not Paul. He goes on to say, I thank God that I baptized none of you except Chrysippus and Gaius. So apparently two people got the elite baptism. And then you've got hundreds of Corinthians who didn't. Maybe thousands who were saying, uh, I, I'll, I want what he's got. I mean, Chrysippus, he got Paul himself. And so Paul is actually grateful. I mean, he's actually grateful that he only baptized two people. And then you see him, well, he's becoming an old man here. He backpedals in the next few verses. He says, well, wait a minute, there was that household. Yeah, yeah, I did baptize them. So he's having a little bit of Alzheimer's, you know, recovering the thoughts of who he... Okay, all right, now, but I still, I mean, come on, if you total it out, I only baptized six or seven people max. So hundreds of people I didn't baptize. And by the way, man, I am so grateful about that. Because if I had baptized dozens or hundreds of people, then guess what? We would have a church split in Corinth, and there would be the Paul group and the non-Paul group. And I don't want anything like that. So he is thanking God that he baptized none of them or just a few. Now, uh, you say, why exactly? Well, not only to avoid divisions and factions, but look at this. Christ did not send me to baptize. Sure, I baptized half a dozen, but that wasn't the mission. Christ did not send me to baptize, but to do what? Preach the gospel, not in cleverness of speech, so that the cross of Christ would not be made void. So Paul's mission was never to dunk people in water. Why is that? Because being dunked in water is not what saves. It's the preaching of the gospel that saves. And so Paul was brought to deliver the message that saves people for by grace through faith. That's how we're saved. It's not of ourselves. It's not about our washings. It's not about our visiting a lake. It's not about a swimming pool. It's not about a baptismal tub. It's about being in Christ. And that's what happens when we hear it and then we believe it and we receive it. We get put, placed, immersed, baptized into Jesus himself. And as we'll see, that is what really saves. Now, water baptism is an awesome symbol. And we baptize people in water here. Uh, at, when I was uh, 15 or 16 years old, I was baptized in a swimming pool. And I remember that day. I remember the opportunity to open my mouth for 10, 15 seconds and just let people know I had received Jesus Christ as my Savior and Lord. And then I was lowered into that swimming pool water and raised up. And you know what? I felt exactly the same coming up out of that water. And you know why? Because I already knew this isn't causing something. This is celebrating something. And so many people got to say amen with me. And I got to receive hugs and, and, and handshakes and congratulations. And it was just a way of me saying corporately or collectively, I identify with Jesus Christ. I am in Him and He is in me. So we celebrate baptism around here just as we celebrate the Lord's Supper, which you uh, enjoyed this morning. Together with me, we celebrated the body and blood of Jesus Christ. But what is the significance of baptism? Well, a friend of mine about a decade ago, he had a little a lesson about baptism, a little lesson for his daughter about baptism right there at the kitchen sink. And some of you know this story, but what he did was he took a bottle, a water bottle just like this, and he took the cap off, unscrewing it, an empty bottle, and he showed it to his daughter, and he said, now what I'm going to do is I'm going to put this in the kitchen sink, and the kitchen sink is full of water. Now what happens when I put this bottle in this water? Well, two things happen. The water is now in the bottle. But also, I want you to notice, the bottle is also in the water. 
So we have water in the bottle and bottle in the water, and then he reached down into this kitchen sink, and he put the cap on, and he sealed it up, and then he said that's what it means to be sealed in Jesus Christ. Now, isn't that cool to think that we are in Christ and Christ is in us? And right there at the kitchen sink, we see a symbol, a picture, a shadow of what it means to be filled with Him, immersed in Him, Him in us, and us in Him. This is the vine and the branches picture all over again. Maybe you don't know the origin of this word baptism, but it is believed, at least, that back in the day, they would uh, crush up seashells by the seashore. You see, I said that pretty well, actually. <laughs> They would crush up seashells by the seashore, and when they did, uh, what would happen next is that they would make a fine powder, and that powder uh, would be purple in color, okay? So it, it might have ended up in a little container like this, and that purple powder would then be uh, put on a garment. It would be on a white garment, perhaps, and then what you would see is that they would take a, a linen, a piece of cloth, and they would dip that down into the purple, purple water, and they would dye it. And so what was white or average or normal or everyday, a piece of cloth for everyday use, would then be made purple and then would be made for royal use. And so it's believed that this is the origin of the original use of this idea of baptism. They would baptize the cloth into a purple dye. Now I've done this for you right here in this bottle. And you'll notice that what appeared to be a clear bottle before is now a purple bottle. It almost, it's almost like it has a new identity. It's almost like it has a new nature. It's almost like it has a new purpose. And so now we put the bottle back in there to demonstrate that we are in Christ and Christ is in us and we together have been dyed purple, made a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people of God's own possession. Amen? Yeah. And so we see this morning that water baptism is a celebration of becoming spiritually purple, becoming spiritual royalty, a royal priesthood, a holy nation. It is not the H2O that causes it. As we'll see today, it is the Spirit of God that has caused it. But when you become a king or a queen, when you become a prince or a princess, when you are moved away from peasantry into a life of royalty, man, that is worth celebrating. And anybody who really understands water baptism, that's what it's about. It's a celebration. It is not going to make you better with God, but it is going to make you say, wow, and thank you. And that's what it's all about. Christ did not send me to baptize, but to preach the gospel. We see in Acts 10 this affirmed, again, this idea that baptism doesn't cause salvation. Acts 10, 47, surely no one can refuse the water for these to be baptized who have received the Holy Spirit just as we did, Kenny. Now you'll notice that Peter is blown over. I mean, Peter is flabbergasted. Peter is shocked that these dirty Gentiles, that's who he's talking about, he comes up upon this crowd of, of Gentiles and they've received the Holy Spirit just as Peter has. And so he says, what prevents, how could we refuse, how could we stop this group from celebrating that they've already got the Holy Spirit? Now, did they already have the Holy Spirit? Yeah. What was the purpose of water baptism? To celebrate it. It didn't cause the Spirit to come, but as a result of the Spirit of, of Jesus Christ living in them, Peter's saying, hey, let's have, let's have a bash, man. Let's have a party about what has already happened. You see here in Acts chapter 2, a popular passage where people say, well, no, 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 no. I mean, baptism causes forgiveness. And it's a misreading of a particular word, which I've put in red for us this morning. But look at Acts 2.38. Repent 
and each of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Now, if this is all we had, if we only had this verse, if we didn't have Acts chapter 10, where we saw they got saved without water, if we didn't have the whole of the New Testament and all the epistles that talk about salvation by grace through faith, and there's no mention of H2O in Romans 6, and there's no mention of H2O in salvation passages, whosoever calls upon the name of the Lord will be saved, no mention of water. Like if we didn't have that, and if all we had was this, this verse set up on a pedestal, misunderstood, then I could see how we arrive at H2O, saves a person. But, curiously, this word for, ice, in the original language, E-I-S, ice can mean in light of. And so it seems to me that in light of the New Testament, in light of the message of salvation, what's really being said here in Acts 2 is be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ in light of the forgiveness of your sins. Water doesn't wash away your sins. It's the blood of Christ that washes away our sins. And so it's not being put in a swimming pool to get rid of sins, as we'll see in the next few verses Clearly, that happens from the blood of Jesus and nothing else. Jesus answered, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the Spirit is spirit. And people quote this verse, and they say, See, you got to be born of water go get in the baptismal, jump in the swimming pool. you got to be born of water and the Spirit in order to see the kingdom of God. And they're assuming, they're assuming that Jesus is talking about water baptism. And friend, this is a case of when we are putting on those baptism glasses, our own preconceived idea, we're going to take our pet theology and put it on as a lens and then look at John chapter 3 and impose water baptism on this when it is not in the text, it is not there, and that is not God's intention. So what's he talking about? Well, it's as easy as this. It's as easy as looking at the next sentence. I mean, if you look at the next sentence, Jesus explains himself, that which is born of what? The flesh, meaning mom. That which is born of mom is flesh, and that which is born of the spirit is spirit. So Jesus is saying the same thing twice. He is saying you've got to be born of water, which, by the way, is the same thing as born of mom. Anybody uh, understand that? I mean, uh, the child is in a sack of water for about nine months, right? Born of water, born of mom. And then later on, eight years, 10 years, 12 years, they hear the gospel, they believe, they receive, and they are born of the Spirit. So Jesus is making it simple. You can have a natural birth, but you're going to need a spiritual birth. It's one thing to exist on this planet. It's another thing to be placed in Christ. And so this dashes against the rocks. It does away with this idea of, are you saved? Well, yeah, I grew up in church. Are you saved? Well, yeah, I mean, my parents are Christian, Christian family. I grew up in a Christian family. See, it's not your natural birth that saves. It is a spiritual birth. And if you don't know what I'm talking about yet, I'm saying that it is not about your heritage or your lineage or your family upbringing or where you were born or how good you were as a kid or the fact that you were never brought into the principal's office and that you've lived a clean life, never smoking and not drinking or maybe not too much and then not hanging out with people that do. And man, I've lived a good life. And so many people think that in their natural birth, They can clean up the natural and be presented to God. And what Jesus is saying is you got to be born naturally, and then there must be a spiritual birth born of the Spirit. Now, for everybody in here who has received Christ, man, there is some awesome news. You're born of the Spirit. That is a pretty cool phrase. I've got my my mom's nose and my dad's jaw, uh, and I look a lot like both of them. I'm born of them. I was born of Farley, naturally. Well, what you find out in being born of the Spirit is you've got the Spirit's heart. You've got Daddy's heart. uh, You've got Daddy's nature. 
You look like daddy on the inside. Abba, Father. We got too many Christians saying, my heart is hard. No, your heart is not hard. You've got daddy's heart. My heart uh, is distant from God. No, you, you've got daddy's heart. You're raised and seated right next to him. Well, you know, there's many rooms in my heart, and God's like a janitor cleaning them all up. We talked about that recently. You've heard that analogy. Jesus is a janitor. Jesus the janitor. And he's mopping up my heart. And he's going from room to room. And some of us have him stuck in the utility closet. Right? <laughs> so if you just let him out, then he could clean up your heart. Look, I understand we've got mindsets and attitudes that are getting cleaned up. The renewing of the mind. But Jesus is not a janitor. He's a heart surgeon. He took out your heart of stone. Gave you a new heart. You don't need to be saying your heart is hard. You might have a hardened attitude, but not a hardened heart. And so we are born of the Spirit. We've got Daddy's heart. Corresponding to that, baptism now saves you, Peter says. Not the removal of dirt from the flesh, but an appeal to God for a good conscience through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. You know what he just did? He just put the brakes on. For anybody who thinks it's about water. Hey, hey, baptism saves, okay? There's a baptism that saves. There is an immersion that saves. Uh, but, 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 but it's not, okay, it's not water baptism. It's not the washing of your body in a swimming pool. It's not the washing away of your sins with H2O. It's not the removal of some sort of spiritual or physical dirt from your body. You got to get put where? Put in the resurrection of Jesus. Do you know that that's what's happened to you? That you were put in the resurrection of Jesus? That Easter is a bigger deal than Christmas? That it's great that Jesus showed up on this planet for us, but 33 years later He died and rose from the dead, and you are a child of the resurrection. He raised you up in Him it's baptism into the resurrection of Jesus that saves us. Or do you not know? Paul says this in Romans chapter 6. Do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus have been baptized into His death? Therefore, we've been buried with Him through baptism into death so that as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, so we too might walk in newness of life. Now, what is this saying? You got done made purple. And I know that's not grammatical. <laughs> you got done made purple. He put you in Christ and you participated in a death burial and resurrection in Christ. Now, we have talked about this so much in this church, but it bears repeating pretty often that we are immersed in Jesus. Jesus is crucified. We're crucified in Him. Jesus is buried. We're buried in Him. Jesus is raised. We're raised in Him. Jesus is seated in heavenly places, and we are seated in Him. This in Him relationship is emphasized six times more often than Jesus being in us. I got Jesus in my heart. Jesus lives in me. Man, that is a solid message worth talking about. But do you know that six times more often the Bible says you're in Jesus? So, you know what? It's great that the water is in the bottle. But six times more often, it says the bottle is in the water. And that means you're safe and secure, enveloped, placed into, immersed, folded into. You are raised up and seated in Christ, in God, hidden with Christ in God, Paul says. I love that. Hidden with Christ in God. Nobody can get to you. The evil one cannot touch you. And so we see this is the reason that we can say no to sin. It's not uh, I can say no to sin once I've had 17 quiet times. It's not that I can say no to sin once I've been to church enough. It's not that I can say no to sin once I muster up the strength somehow. It's not that I can say no to sin once I arrive at maturity, whenever that might be. 
I get to say I'm dead to that thought and alive to my God because he carried me through a heart surgery. I died with Jesus and woke up a brand new person. And that thought used to be for me when I was a plain old cloth. That used to be for me. But I'm telling you, I got done made purple. And that thought ain't purple. Amen? Amen. I did not recognize... Him, but he who sent me, this is John the Baptist, he who sent me to baptize in water said to me, he upon whom you see the Spirit descending and remaining upon him, this is the one who baptizes in what? In the Holy Spirit. Friends, this is what it's about. This is the way to salvation. We get put in the Holy Spirit. Water is a fantastic image of that. But the one who came, Jesus Christ is the one who puts us in the Spirit. There is one body, as we conclude today. There is one Spirit, just as also you were called into one hope of your calling. Look at this, how unifying this is. This is about baptism and unity. One Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is over all and through all and in all. How beautiful Ephesians 4 is. We may not think of baptism as unity, but there is a spiritual baptism that has unified us. There are people today teaching a false doctrine. And they are teaching that there is a message for the Jews and then a, a different message for the Gentiles. That the new covenant is just for the Jews and then the Gentiles have some other message. So we should be, well, we should be Paul only people. We should only study Paul, only listen to Paul because Paul wrote the Gentiles. Everybody else wrote the Jews. And so we've got two gospels or two messages that are running on different paths. Now, what does this verse say? One hope, one Lord, one faith. One baptism, one God, for who? For all. All who is over all and through all and in all for everybody. Put another way, 1 Corinthians 12, though there are many, though there are many, they are one body, so also is Christ. For by one Spirit we were all baptized into one body, whether Jews or Greeks, whether Jews or Gentiles. Whether slaves or free, we were all made to drink of one spirit. So he puts the Jewish person in Christ. And he puts the Gentile person in Christ. And we're all made one through spiritual baptism into Jesus. There are not two gospels. There are not two messages. There is one unifying message that we get to celebrate. Being in Jesus is what it's about for everybody. For all of you who were baptized into Christ have clothed yourselves with Christ. There is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither slave nor free man. There is neither male nor female. For you are all one in Christ Jesus. Your gender doesn't give you your value. Your lineage on this planet, your heritage, your upbringing, your family name doesn't bring you your value. Your value comes from being clothed in Christ. And I know what people think. The first minute we think of being clothed in Christ, we think it's a great cover-up. That God is doing a fantastic cover-up of who we are. We need to emphasize and repeat again and again. You got born of the Spirit, so there's no cover-up. And then you got clothed with Jesus Christ. You were placed, baptized into His death, into His burial, into His resurrection, born of Him, righteous at the core, and then you got clothed with Christ. It is no cover-up. He sees you as you, and He is pleased with who you are. So today we've seen so much. I mean, we've seen the lie that you must be baptized in water to be saved. And this idea is rampant. You can find it just a few miles from here. You can find it all over this nation and beyond. People want to look at something tangible and physical and measurable just like 2,000 years ago with the Judaizers and circumcision. 
But today we've changed that into baptism, adding to the work of Jesus, saying this is what saves, and ultimately spitting at the foot of the cross, spitting at that tomb and saying that is not enough. It's Jesus plus. Well, this morning we have seen that it is Jesus plus nothing. No additives. Nothing to muck it up. You are not baptized into water to be saved. The truth is, baptism into Christ Himself saves us. Let's pray together. Father, we thank You for this simple truth. It may be something we don't even wrestle with, but we wrestle with, are we clean and we need to know we're in? We wrestle with, are we okay with You? Are You mad at us? And we need to know we're in. We wrestle with if we're distant and dirty, but we need to know we're in. Again and again, we ask you, are we okay? Is there something wrong with us? Did we flub it up? Did we mess it up? Are we still safe? Are we still secure? Are we okay with you? Father, we thank you for the simple, straightforward message from your word that this is it. You're in. You're in me. You're enveloped, you're safe, you're secure, it's solid, it's unbreakable, it's unshakable. I and you and you and me. Father, we thank you for that, we believe that, we celebrate that. We are grateful for the heart surgery, the DNA swap, the fusion of you with us so that we can be one with Jesus Christ. In his name we pray, amen.